We have a um, very exciting uh, seminar today, which is on trademarks, uh, and we are very fortunate to have with us Professor Georg von Grevenetz uh, from the University of East Anglia. And uh, Georg is uh, one of the relatively few economists uh, who work uh, on trademarks, and especially if you compare the research uh, that exists in the field of trademarks to the research that exists in the field of patents, uh, it is much more at its infancy. Um, but hopefully this is going to change. You know, one of the things that really has uh, driven research in the patent area was uh, uh, the um, availability of, of new patent databases. And I think something similar is uh, um, happening in the field of trademarks, uh, where uh, now researchers increasingly have access uh, to unit record uh, trademark uh, filing and registration data from trademark offices. And uh, Georg is one of the economists uh, who has uh, employed these data um, for um, a number of studies. Uh, the study that he's going to present today is on the phenomenon of trademark cluttering, and he will give the full motivation. Uh, but what is interesting, if you read one of the, um, I guess, seminal economic treatments on trademark law, uh, by Landers and Posner, which was written in the late 1980s, uh, they essentially say that, you know, the name limited and uh, as such you know there's no shortage of possible names that uh, could be converted into brands um, if you contrast uh, that uh, with um, um, you know um, the registries uh, in uh, many trademark offices and you know if you um, talk to some of the practitioners in the field they very much say well you know they're concerned about the namespace possibly running out and uh, they're increasing costs uh, company phase and coming up uh, with new trade names whether or not you know, we face situations of, 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 of cluttered trademark registers, uh, you know, I don't want to pass judgment on this. I think that's ultimately an empirical question. But I think the first, at least as far as I'm, I'm aware of, the first study that sort of tries to rigorously look at this is Georg's study um, on trademark clattering in, in Europe. And he uses a, a natural experiments uh, that uh, was given by the enlargement of the European Union uh, to study what effect uh, it, it had on, 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 on possible cluttering um, um, behavior. Um, before I give the floor to Georg, just one or two words uh, of, of, of biographical background. Uh, um, professor van Grevenetz uh, is a professor at the University of East Anglia uh, in, in the United Kingdom. Um, he's also affiliated uh, with the Center for Competition Policy at that university, as well as uh, with the Ox Oxford Intellectual Property Re Research Center at Oxford University. He was previously a professor at uh, the um, Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich, and uh, he has uh, studied and taught uh, um, uh, economics uh, in both Germany and uh, in the United Kingdom. And as I mentioned, uh, he's one of the relatively few economists, and hopefully it's a growing community, um, that does uh, research on, on trademarks. Uh, so we are very happy you're, you're here and we look forward to your presentation. Um, I'm very pleased to speak about the topic here because I hope that there are people in the room who may know something about this topic that I haven't found out yet. It's, it's as Carsten said, a very new topic and I've been going through a review process and in this process my referees have motivated me to look at certain aspects of this more and more and so I, I keep learning and I'm sure that some of you will have uh, additional points to make so please if there's anything you don't understand or anything where you think I've got it wrong or whether you have information then please just interrupt me. Um, <clears throat> yeah so um, let's uh, start so the, the, the data I'm going to use comes from the European Trademark Office, which started in 1996 in Alicante. And uh, they've been very generous in allowing me to use their data um, for various studies. And so I'm very grateful for that. So this particular study, let me just, ah, oh, wait, this is not connected, of course. So I'm actually going to have to go like this. So this, I'm going to jump over this. You're going to, um, so this particular study was motivated really by um, a piece of work that uh, we did for the European Commission several years ago. So the Max Planck Institute in Munich was asked by the European Commission to evaluate the European trademark system after it had been set up and had been running for a while. And um, I was asked to supply some economic analysis. And so I was party to some of the meetings that the Max Planck Institute organized with various people, stakeholders of the system. And so at one of these meetings, the uh, representatives of the pharmaceutical industry made plain this worry that Carsten just pointed out, that they had the feeling that um, in their particular uh, domain, if you like, it was getting more difficult to register trademarks. 
and that this had something to do with the fact that there were maybe too many trademarks or a lot of trademarks on the register. Um, and so I got interested in that and we, uh, we tried to put that into the study and this is really where this began. So as, as you just pointed out, um, Landis and Posner argue that uh, in principle the supply of names for trademarks is unlimited. We can, you know, we can come up with new variations, uh, letters, figurative elements um, infinitely. And so in, in, in a sense there's no issue here of, of uh, too much being on the register. There's always space for more. What, what changes in this particular context a little bit is that um, in the context of medicines, the, uh, um, the regulators became aware in the early 90s, mid 90s, of cases where um, particular patients, I'll give an example in a minute, were prescribed the wrong medicine because somebody uh, made a mistake and it wasn't the doctor, it was actually at the, hand, at the process where the medicine was handed out um, and gave them the wrong medicine and this can be very dangerous. Uh, for the individual involved. And so the, um, <clears throat> the authorities have tried to limit the scope for this kind of thing um, by basically regulating the namespace and making sure that the names are distinct enough for these kinds of mistakes not to happen. Okay? And this introduces an element of scar scarcity. Suddenly we have a second authority, it's not just the trademark office now, but there's an independent agency which has totally different considerations which comes along and says you cannot have that particular name for this particular medical product. So you might be able to get a trademark for it, but uh, the trademark is useless to you as a, as a pharmaceutical company because you can't employ it in the course of trade. Huh? Okay, so um, the, the response, and I've got quite a lot of anecdotal evidence for this and also some evidence in the data that the companies have come up with, the obvious response is to file multiple names. If you don't know whether a particular name is going to run into trouble, then you just file a lot of them and hope for the best. And typically that's what happens and the firms have worked out how many they need to file. So then the interesting question is, well, what happens to all the names you didn't end up using after you've gone through the process that end up on the trademark register? Because contrary to what I've heard from some people at, this, uh, at the medical agencies, it's not that the firms go to the medical regulator first and wait for the medical regulator to make a decision and then file the trademark, they will file the trademarks first to make sure that those are covered. Yeah? And then they go to the medical regulator. So as a consequence, we have, we have uh, excess uh, names on the register. And in some cases, maybe the firms will reuse the names for all other projects. Um, but in many cases, they will just be there and be unused. And so the interesting question is, d does this matter? And when we did the study for the commission, with the numbers I could come up with at the time, the, the lawyers involved basically said, well, this is trivial. This is not important. There's not, you know, the, the clutter might be there, but it's more an academic issue. It's not really a big empirical problem. Okay? So <clears throat> in this particular paper, what I'm doing is I'm using the expansion of the European trademark system in 2004, which was just a consequence of the fact that the European Union was enlarged. You know, Ten extra members joined, the 15 at the time. Um, to see what happens, because essentially what happens in the regulatory space here is that before you're facing one European regulator who farms out the actual decision to 15 member states, and all of a sudden there are 10 more. And each one of those local agencies could say, well, this particular name in our particular context doesn't work because it's misleading or there could be a mis you know, people could make a mistake. So essentially, um, it becomes more difficult to get the names through this particular um, approval process and as a consequence you might expect that the firms will apply for more trademarks simultaneously. Yeah? That's essentially what I'm trying to find out. Okay, so first of all let's just have a look at uh, how this office operates and how it sort of works. So in 96 you see the office beginning and there's a big spike of applications um, simply because people had lined up, they knew this office was going to start, so they all sent their trademarks there. And then we can see that over time there's an increase, obviously, in demand for these types of European trademarks. Um, there's a big bump here which reflects the internet uh, bubble, because a lot of companies that went into business at the time were, were taking out names, and there was a big discussion about the connection between the domains and the, and, and the patents and the trademarks. Then you have this very distinct spike here, and this is EU enlargement. And the basic uh, context here is that 
Um, the way the European Union, um, the, the accession countries, the negotiations worked in such a way that essentially the new countries had to accept all the trademarks that were in the system. There was no re-examination of existing trademarks. So essentially if you could get into the OHIM system before the deadline, then your trademark automatically got extended to these new countries without further um, uh, examination. And so obviously it's very interesting uh, to meet that particular deadline and that's why you get this spike. Yeah? Okay, and then we get an increase and the decline here at the end is a, is a truncation issue. That's just because the data end there and so I, I don't have um, um, more recent data which would tell me what's happening there. Okay. So, as I already mentioned, the, the uh, work we did for, for the Commission basically suggested that there might be an issue. Yeah? Uh, I found this study by L'Allemand, which is, a, uh, is basically a piece of commissioned work for, by, by a company that supplies um, uh, trademark data, where he analyzes this particular market and says, and it, I find the analysis very interesting, he says um, that five to ten different trademarks for each trial drugs are sort of routinely filed. Okay. And I talked to the, pharma the, the trademark council of one of the German uh, companies that works in this, er in this context and, and he said to me, it's very simple, if I don't have a trademark when the product is ready, I lose my job. So I will do everything to prevent that from happening and so I will file as many trademarks as is necessary and he completely confirmed the numbers. He said that that, that was the same. So what we see in 2004 is the following countries, as I'm sure you're aware, joined the European Union and thereby they also joined uh, the European Trademark Office and uh, the European Medicines Agency became um, <coughs> the agency that governed um, uh, the, the pharmaceutical names in these countries as well. Okay, so the interesting question now is, is can, can we see any effects? of this uh, kind of behavior. And so before we go on to that, let me show you a little bit uh, why this really is an issue. So here's a particular example. We have uh, a, a product which is taken by people who have uh, problems with their um, uh, stomach. So if you have you know, um, ulcers or, or a danger of ulcers, then you would be prescribed uh, this Lossex. And uh, then Lossex is a product which is uh, product prescribed against hypertension, so high blood pressure. So as you can imagine these are very different conditions. And um, if both of these conditions are potentially very dangerous if they're extreme. And so if you got the wrong medicine, you, would, you, know, you wouldn't alleviate the symptoms. This could get very bad for you. Yeah? So uh, the FDA actually forced AstraZeneca to change the name Lossic to pre -Losic because there were concerns about uh, confusion here. And what then happened is that somebody mistaked Prelosec for Prozac uh, in a pharmacy and the person who was supposed to get Prelosec had a gastric ulcer. So again, Prozac wasn't going to do much good there. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> um, so, you know, you, I mean, when you, and, and I guess when you look at these things, yeah, when you look at these things, when we look at them, I, I guess it doesn't seem likely that you would confuse this. Yeah? But what does happen often in many countries still is that the doctor actually writes the prescription in handwriting on a piece of paper. Yeah, they don't type it. Yeah? And then you take it to the pharmacy and the pharmacist has to work out what this means. So I guess that's where these things happen. Yeah? And, and um, these kinds of mistakes happen also in hospitals and you know, there's a lot of evidence for this kind of uh, mix-ups happening. Um, so the naming committees were established to prevent these mistakes. And, and they work on the premise that these mistakes can and will happen and they are very restrictive. So they're very strict. What's quite interestingly is that when you look at the context of the European uh, Trademark Office, uh, the opposition chambers at the OHIM actually when they're dealing with uh, opposition cases between tr uh, names for pharmaceuticals argue that because this is such a vital kind of space where people are really you know, in danger of making uh, uh, fatal mistakes, people are going to be very attentive and very careful. And therefore, their standard of proof for confusion is actually very high in this context. So they're, they're coming at it from exactly the opposite uh, sort of, uh, so let's say, viewpoint. Yeah? Um, which maybe, you know, from the, from the two agencies' uh, perspectives makes sense, but it's interesting when you can comp contrast that. Yeah? So they're both regulating this space. And, um, I had a very interesting, I tried at some stage when I was starting this work, I called up the European Medicines Agency and tried to contact them to see whether they had any statements to make about what, you know, what was going on here. And 
they weren't even aware that people take out trademarks for these names before the names come to them. Uh, so they didn't believe that this was the case. So it, it shows you that there's a total disconnect between these two um, uh, operators here. Okay, so here's an interesting bit of data from L'Allemand. I don't know whether it's terribly reliable because it really is quite difficult to get data from, from the European Medicines Agency. They, they publish only the, the, the things they approve. So all the, the rejected names, you don't actually get to see. They're not on the internet. You can't um, see them. So how he got this data, I'm not quite sure. But um, if we take it at face value, then it suggests that before 2004, it was indeed slightly easier to get trademarks, so to get names approved, than it became after 2004, which suggests that this idea that extending to 10 additional countries actually did make it more difficult. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, you know, a big international pharmaceuticals company is going to face not only the European Medicines Agency, but they're going to face the, Euro the American Trademark Office, the European Trademark Office, the American Food and Drug Administration, and the European Medicines Agency. So these are the four principal sort of hurdles, but there are probably many more you know, in terms of the other jurisdictions. Um, <clears throat> So, and just to point this out again, the rejection of a name would mean that the product launch would be delayed, which in, in context of pharmaceutical products is really, uh, can, can quickly add up to very large numbers, so it can be very expensive. Now, one of the things that the refereeing process threw up that I didn't f initially investigate very heavily was, well, what does it actually cost to create these names? Yeah? If we go back to Landis and Posner, who say it's actually very easy to make names, and you know, the variation here is, 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 is very sort of, uh, there's a lot of possibilities. What's the big deal? Well, it, so I, I initially found only evidence from the web. And then finally, I actually did find a few uh, publications. So this one uh, by Kinagi and Stein, and then a more recent one by Wick, who suggest various numbers for the cost of producing a set of names. So this would be your five or 10 names that you're trying to generate um, to protect your pharmaceutical product. And, and these numbers are not, you know, they may seem high if you're coming from the perspective that it's fairly easy, easy for any of us to doodle around and, you know, make up fake names. Um, but it's not extreme when you compare it to some of the numbers that, let's say, the Olympic Committee pays for, a, for, a, for a, a, you know, the device for the Olympic Games in London or uh, that, you know, Oxfam recently paid to have a new logo for, that it could use uniformly across its shops in the UK. So this is a... Um, <coughs> Um, an NGO, um, and, and you know, so they all spend around about this kind of money uh, for, for these uh, types of um, uh, trademarks or fig figurative devices. Um, <clears throat> so what actually goes on here at the pharmaceutical, sort of in the pharmaceutical context is that the, the uh, consultants who will work in this context will hire uh, people who work in the, uh, in the medical context in different countries and ask them to perform prescription simulation exercises. So exactly the kind of thing we just said. They will write down the names, and then we will take it to the pharmacy and see what the pharmacist thinks this is, and whether there, are any, there is any confusion. Yeah? Um, they will perform tests of name similarity, tests of implied claims. So this is also something that's very uh, important to the agencies, that um, the name of the pharmaceutical product shouldn't suggest that the pharmaceutical product is going to do anything particularly well or particularly badly. Yeah? So it shouldn't imply that it's good for this or that particular ailment. Uh, it should be a neutral name. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, tests of visual and verbal similarity, linguistic analysis. So there's a fairly large number of tests that these things have to run through. And I guess the costs really come from the fact that the people you hire here to perform these tests with are professionals. Um, you, just, you, you don't just go on the street and take a random focus group. Uh, so there's a, probably a, a, an element of cost of time. So now the interesting question, of course, is, and this is one that I'm not able to really admit, uh, sort of uh, address in this study because I don't really see how to identify it, is, is what proportion of these costs is due to the fact that there are many other names on the register. Yeah? So it stands to reason that there's going to be an issue here. If there are more names on the register, then this group of people is going to have more work to do to figure out whether there could be confusion. Um, but uh, saying exactly which proportion of these costs is due to that is difficult. So the only other thing that I found is another study uh, by these two gentlemen here who sent out some questionnaires to US companies in, uh, <coughs> in the mid-90s 
and they asked them to try and figure out how much it cost them to create uh, trademark names. And I adjusted this number, so the number they report in the paper is slightly lower, but I've adjusted it because it came out in 97, so I took a, a sort of uh, an inflation adjustment here. So essentially, the, you can see that there's a factor of 10 here, if not more, you know, difference. Some proportion of that factor of 10 difference must be coming from this cluttering. Yeah? But as I say, it remains open to debate which proportion that is. OK. <clears throat> so the, the idea that I had was that I could use the European Union enlargement in 2004 as a kind of shock. Yeah? And economists like studying these shocks because if they are if they're unanticipated, then they have direct sort of responses on the parties which reveal something about underlying economic mechanisms that we normally can't see. Yeah, we, can, we can see a sort of causal effect that's very hard to detect otherwise. Yeah? So what I wanted to try and do is actually to try and use this particular shock to see whether I could see what the difference in cluttering was as a consequence of this enlargement. Okay? So there are a couple of questions you have to answer here. So first of all, is this an experiment? Yeah. So one way this could maybe not end up being an experiment if, if actually things that were happening in the trademark context were driving EU enlargement, yeah, then the causal effect that I'm trying to identify is actually sort of not there because it's actually the trademark filing which is causing European enlargement and not the other way around, that it's European enlargement which is causing a, a change in trademark filing. So in this particular case, I think it's, it's pretty safe to argue that European enlargement had nothing to do with what was happening in trademarks. Okay, that was a political process, there were lots of other things going on, but I don't think there's much of a link to the trademark system. So in that sense, we can probably argue that there's an, ex, you know, that there's a sort of an exogenous shock here. Okay. Now, the other thing that's interesting is to ask, well, what are the outcomes here? So if we're looking at um, this uh, in a particular economic framework, the interesting question is, if there hadn't been the shock, what would pharmaceutical firms have done yeah, in the alternative case? And uh, so that's also important to, to bear in mind exactly what we're studying. So what we're studying here now is how does the behavior of the pharmaceutical firms change as a consequence of enlargement? And that's not just as trivial as saying um, they apply for more or less trademarks. It's a little bit more complicated than that. We may have to take into account that if they anticipate that enlargement is coming, and if it's sufficiently costly to them, that may have effects on their decisions to actually continue operating in this particular space. Yeah? So if you thought that the cost increment was very large, some of the firms might switch out of the whole thing entirely and say we give up. Yeah? Now again, that's probably not likely here, although the costs are there, they're not that big. You know, relative to the profits that pharmaceutical companies make, uh, these costs are still relatively small. Okay? Um, <clears throat> but we have to take the reactions of the pharmaceutical firms into account um, and, and, and deal with them. And so the last question here is, so what happens? How does the pharmaceutical firm decide to stay a pharmaceutical firm or not? And, and I think the, the mainly, so the, the main the uh, point you have to bear in mind here is when does the pharmaceutical firm make which decision? So essentially the pharmaceutical firm will do R&D quite a number of years before the product comes to market. Yeah? And uh, there are studies which show that this, this delay can be anything from five to eight years. It might even be longer than that. Yeah? So if you think the R&D decision is taken um, in the 90s for products that come out around about when EU enlargement happens. Okay. So now the interesting question is, so at that time, did they know that European enlargement would happen in 2004? So is it conceivable that they factored that into their decision of how much money to spend on a particular class of drugs? Yeah. And I think that's very unlikely. They may have, and you know, obviously there was a discussion of whether this could happen or not, but the actual decisions, the political decisions that were taken uh, for, for exactly when it would happen uh, were taken later. Um, so what we can assume is that the pharmaceutical firms had a program of research which was running and then at some stage the political decision gets taken for enlargement and then the pharmaceutical firm has to respond to the implications of that which is that it becomes more difficult to get trademarks or names accepted for particular products that are in the pipeline. 
So what I've done, uh, this was also in response to some of these uh, referee uh, comments, was that I, I, I haven't done, I haven't given you the full formal model here because it, it, that I think that would take us too far into uh, sort of a fairly non-productive uh, territory right now. But um, <clears throat> essentially, I'm making the argument I just made. So firms make a long-run decision to undertake R&D. And they make short-run marketing and regulatory compliance investments. So here, these are the investments in the names. Okay? So essentially, if you think that R&D investments pay off in period T, um, they are made, sorry, they're, they're undertaken in period T, the, they pay off two periods later, and the name investment is done somewhere in the middle. Okay? Um, and then what I can so, show is that a regulatory regulatory change in uh, period capital T that is announced one period before will lead to increased trademark applications for products that were in the cohort of R&D investments made one period before that. So really what I'm trying to say is there is a group of pharmaceutical research uh, products which essentially the firm has spent the R&D on so it can't adjust there anymore but what it can adjust is the number of names that it might apply for. Yeah? But there's no other adjustment that's going to happen. Okay, that's the essential point. Because for, for later uh, cohorts, what could happen is that not only do they change the number of names they apply for, but they could also adjust the R&D investment. And so then I have two effects going on in the data, and these may counteract each other. So it's not so clear anymore what I'm seeing when I'm looking at the data. Okay. Okay, so, and this is the second result, yeah? So if, if uh, uh, sort of later on, the firms may factor in these additional costs into their uh, uh, decisions. Okay, so how do economists study this? Well, there's this, this very scary looking expression here, which is the empirical specification that I'm gonna estimate. Yeah? But it, it's actually fairly simple. This is a differences in differences model. So the idea is this. You have two groups of companies. You have the pharmaceutical companies and you have all the others. Yeah? And you look at those before and after the shock. Yeah? And so the idea is that the other companies will give me the baseline. They tell me what would have happened to the pharmaceutical companies if there hadn't been a shock. Yeah? And so <clears throat> then I can work out the the the... So the difference for the non-pharmaceutical firms tells me what is the underlying trend. Yeah? So are the firms anyway applying for more trademarks or less trademarks simultaneously? Yeah? And then the difference between that and the difference for the pharmaceutical companies tells me what is the actual effect of the shock. Okay, that's that's what, what I'm trying to identify here. Yeah? And so what this is really doing is that I've here on the left-hand side what I have is a measure which is the simultaneous applications for names on a given day by a particular firm. That's what I'm actually looking at, okay? And when I've discussed this with various people, they've, they've said, well, you know, there are all sorts of issues. How can you be sure that, that all these names are actually going for the same product? Yeah. And the answer is I can't be. So there's gonna be some, some measurement error, as we call that, um, in there. Um, but it still seems to be the case that uh, in, in many cases the firms are actually making these applications for one particular product on a given day. You know, I've, I've checked that a little bit. If you look at the data, um, it looks quite good. There are a couple of outliers. So there are a couple of cases in my data where a firm is putting in several hundred names on a given day. Yeah? And that's quite clearly not for one particular product. This is a firm entering the system. <coughs> And so I've run specifications where those particular instances are not part of the, you know, not, they're, they're removed from the data. It doesn't make any difference. Um, <clears throat> okay, so down here, I don't know how well you can see this. There are a couple of things that um, are important when you run this kind of model. And you'll see that, I'll show it in, in, in the data again. So the first one is that the two groups are actually, if you like, affected by the same forces. Yeah? If there are totally different forces affecting the incentives of these two types of firms to make investments in names, then the comparison of the two groups doesn't give me anything yeah? because they're, they, they, they're just not comparable, yeah? essentially. So the technical term for this is common trends. So we'll have to look at the data to see that whether somewhere before the shock became uh, sort of part of the, you know, before we started discussing European enlargement seriously, um, are the firms behaving more or less in the same way? If that's not the case, then, then we have to worry about the quality of the empirical results, okay? 
Um, now, another thing that's important here is that the pharmaceutical firms tend to be quite different from the vast majority of the other trademark applicants because they're much larger. You know? They operate in much more concentrated markets. So that's going to be an issue. Do I have to control for that? How do I, how do I deal with this? So if that doesn't affect the trend, but it just affects the absolute number of simultaneous applications, it doesn't matter. You know? <clears throat> okay, now there's another way of doing this. So this, this difference in differences model was one way of doing it. Another mo uh, way of doing this is, is essentially um, what's called um, a matching process. So there what I do is I take the pharmaceutical company and I look at its characteristics and then I try and look in my data for another company that has the same characteristics, so same size. Yeah? has been active in pharmaceutical, has been active in trademarks for the same duration, yeah? um, maybe comes from the same country, okay, Th these kinds of things, has a similar size stock of trademarks, all sorts of characteristics of the company that you might think were important in this context, and then I just compare those two companies before and after, yeah? um, <clears throat> and so here what I'm doing is I'm essentially um, moving into a framework where we really think of this as an experiment, yeah? Now, in a, in a natural science experiment, you, it's a controlled experiment. Yeah? And I normally do what's called random assignment. So I pick randomly the people who get the pill and the other people don't get the pill, and then I can do a comparison, right? So obviously, in this context here, I don't have that. Yeah? Pharmaceutical firms are not randomly picked to be pharmaceutical firms. Yeah? So this is the assignment issue again. And uh, so the interesting question is, can I, can I apply the, the sort of methodology of a random experiment to this particular context, or is it actually not possible because the group of firms I'm looking at is selected in a speci specific way? They've become pharmaceutical firms for particular reasons. Yeah? So there's a, there's a sort of set of very technical uh, sort of discussions in the economics literature where people essentially argue, and this is Imbens here, he says, so if the participation, so being a pharmaceutical firm here, is separated from the outcome, so in this case, how many names we apply for, then we can argue that we can use the analogy to a natural science experiment anyway, even though assignment isn't random. Yeah? Okay, so the question is whether treatment uptake depends on variables that have no effect on outcomes, okay, even if we don't see those variables. So we, then we go back to the model and we can have a long discussion about what motivated these companies to become pharmaceutical companies at the time when they were doing the R&D or to stay pharmaceutical companies and whether this is in any way related to the decision about how many names to apply for several years later. And so my argument here would be that actually these decisions are fairly far apart and probably the reasons for doing the two things are fairly different. So I'm quite happy to apply this particular analogy. Okay, that's, that's the kind of uh, implicit um, story here. And I'll show you the results from the two. It's quite interesting to compare those. Right, so when you do this kind of study, uh, what's important now is to... Um, determine who are the groups, the group, which is the group of firms that is being affected by enlargement and which is the group of firms uh, because they're pharmaceutical companies and who are all the others. And here the problem is that I just have register data. And so what I can do in the register data, and this is what I do do, is I can go into the niece classes. And so the trademark system is separated up into different classes and each class is specific for a particular group of products. And what I can do is, is um, say, well, here's a class that is clearly contains the pharmaceutical applications, yeah? but it may also contain applications for pharmaceutical products that are not regulated by this name regulator. Yeah? So it will contain other pharmaceutical products like this bandage, yeah? where the name of the bandage is, is not regulated in any sense. Yeah? Okay, so that's an issue. Uh, with the data. So in my group of treated firms, those ones which are affected, I will have some which are actually not really treated. They shouldn't be in that particular group, but I can't perform the identification who is really producing uh, medicines that are, are subject to name regulation and who is not. Okay. 
Uh, what I can do is I can identify companies who are applying for trademarks in a completely different space. You know, so for ice cream or cheese or cars or something like that. You know, so I can separate. So essentially what I did was that I started out saying there's class 5 which has all these pharmaceutical products in them. Yeah? And then I looked at all the other niche classes and said, well, how often do firms simultaneously apply for that particular niche class in conjunction with class 5? Yeah? So a pharmaceutical firm may go for class 5, class 3, and class 1 yeah, fairly often, um, <coughs> whereas other class firms will go for class 11, 24, and 32 in a combination. Yeah? Um, <coughs> and so I separated the classes into two set, three sets, those which are really closely related to class 5, those are, that never really have any connection to class 5, and then sort of more amorphous intermediate group. Okay, and then using that, I created four different groups. Uh -huh. I said, <clears throat> if the application falls into, into classes that are very closely connected to pharmaceuticals, then it's a pharmaceuticals application. If it falls into classes that are very different from pharmaceuticals only, then it's an artifacts. This is a name that I made up, uh -huh. application. If it falls into that intermediate group, um, then it's this, and then there's also an overlap between the pharmaceuticals and the artifacts. So there's a sort of mixed group. Yeah. Um, so these are basically the sets of groups that I identified. And I'm really only interested in how the applications that go into this group differ from any of these. Okay? The differences between these don't really matter. They're helpful in the sense that in my study, I don't expect very big differences between these two groups. So if I did find big differences between the, these two groups, that would open up questions about the, the way I'm, I'm looking at the data. You know, there's obviously something going on uh, that I don't um, necessarily understand. So just to take you back to what is it I'm looking at. So the, fundamentally, it's quite simple. I'm just looking at the number of names that a firm puts to the trademark office on a given day in a particular set of niche classes. So the pharmaceutical firm will take out five, eight, ten simultaneously, and other companies may take out two or three simultaneously, or only just one. Yeah? And so what you have here on the left hand is the logarithm of the average number of simultaneous applications uh, in a particular class um, at a given date. Okay? And the red line here are the pharmaceutical applicants, the black line are the artifacts, and these are the two other groups. And I have put around these numbers, these, these lines, the confidence intervals. Okay, so these, this is basically the range of 95% of the observations sort of in that particular class. Okay? Um, <clears throat> all right, so what you can see is that until just before the internet bubble, well, I don't know whether you want to call this common trends, but essentially the things seem to be moving more or less in the same direction. You know, it's fairly flat. Yeah? There's not much variation. And then you can see that the internet bubble has an effect in all of these areas. The number of simultaneous applications seems to go up a little bit. It goes up particularly in pharmaceuticals, and then it stays up there at a higher range. Yeah? Increases again just before enlargement and then drops down and we, that, that difference between the groups stays the same, okay? Um, <clears throat> so now there's something that's important here, um, which is that the, the shock I'm interested in is the one that happens here in 2004. This is where enlargement happens. So in, in the canonical type of uh, application of this particular method, what you would really like to see is this red line more or less on a par with the black line until about here, and then suddenly jumping up, and then staying up here. Okay? So that's quite clearly not what we see. Yeah? So what we see is the two lines, the two sets of lines are separating much earlier. So when I saw that, I started thinking about this. I thought, well, you know, does this mean that the whole thing is, is, is sort of, that is, we can forget about this? And then I realized, well, actually, what's important here is the Treaty of Nice, which is the treaty that established that in 2004 we would have enlargement. Yeah. And that's really the political statement where all the countries come together and say, okay, now we make a legal binding agreement that we will enlarge in three years' time. Yeah. So then you could say, well, actually, the shock, if you like, for the pharmaceutical companies is here. 
And it's important to bear in mind here that the pharmaceutical companies will take out the name several years in advance. They will anticipate uh, that they want the product on the market two or three years from now or four years from now and will take out the names then. Uh. Okay, so then, then it looks more likely, if you like, that there was actually an effect here. Uh. Um, <clears throat> okay, so statistically what we now do is we just transfer this visual idea into a statistical model which allows us to filter out a couple more effects. You know, we can add sort of uh, variables that may filter out effects for the size of the company to some extent and, and maybe the country the company is coming from and things like that which might also affect the t tendency of the company to apply for more or less names. Okay, this is uh, sort of descriptive data. We were just describing the uh, the data here. So what I did is once, as I told you uh, before, I did, uh, I've done it for the whole sample and then I threw out all these outliers. So the cases where the firm applies for 127 marks at the same time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and you can see here there's an extreme outlier here where one company is applying for 634 trademarks on one day. Yeah. This is quite, I see this sometimes. This is clearly a company which has decided, they, you know, what ha often happens is the companies watch this new trademark system for a while, and they may even participate to the extent that they oppose other applicants, but they don't file. And then at some date, they suddenly decide, okay, now it's, it's important for us to take out trademarks within this system, and then they enter. And then it's an avalanche. They come in with everything they have on one day. Yeah? And so that's what we're seeing over here, okay? Um, but as I said, in this, in, this, in this particular sample here where I'm giving you these means, I've basically filtered those out. Okay, and these are some of the variables that I try and uh, use as additional um, controls to, to kind of uh, uh, make sure that the comparison I'm making is actually um, even-handed uh, as far as is possible with this data. Okay, so here are the results, the, the statistical results, and what we're looking for now is the uh, interaction of um, the dummy which identifies the particular shock I'm interested in. So here we have anticipation. So this is the effect of uh, applications between 2001 and 2004 and the applicant coming from the group of pharmaceutical firms. Okay? And this, this, this uh, effect here is a comparison against a baseline which is all those companies that are not in pharmaceuticals, not in artifacts, and not in food and household, yeah, um, <clears throat> in that period, okay? So it's, it's a comparison uh, of the difference in the behavior of the pharmaceutical firm before and after 2001 relative to the difference in the behavior of, of the uh, sort of comparison group. And so what you can see is there's a significant positive increase in the number of simultaneous applications at that time. Okay, that's what this blue thing is showing you. And even if we compare after 2004 with the period before 2001, we still have that effect. It's a little bit weaker, but there's still an effect. Okay. So essentially what this shows is that European enlargement had a effect on the simultaneous applications of the pharmaceutical companies relative to all other companies. Yeah. Okay, now there are various things you can do to see whether this effect is real. Uh, you, could, you could argue there, there may be something wrong with the econometric model that I'm using. So first I threw out all these outliers. I kicked out all these companies applying for large numbers of firm, uh, trademarks to see whether this was robust. And essentially you see the effect doesn't change very much. Um, then you might say, well, the way I've controlled for time effects, so for macroeconomic shocks that are happening over time, might be uh, wrong or not sort of uh, fine enough, so I introduced, instead of controlling for years, I controlled for the quarter. That also has no effect. It doesn't change anything very much. And then there's a, an, an important test which you can do, which is to include a time trend. So you just say that instead of allowing things to vary from quarter to quarter, you could argue there's an underlying trend upward or downward in the data. Okay. So it's interesting what happens when you put that in because in the context of this kind of study, that often means that the effect vanishes, the one that you're studying. Yeah? And in fact, here we can see that now um, the comparison of uh, sort of what happened before 2001 and what happens after 2004 
is no longer sort of statistically significant. There's no, the effect isn't strong enough for an economist to say, okay, this matters. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> but still, the period between 2001 and 2004, we still have that effect. Okay? So there, there was something, at least for uh, a short period of time, if we include the time trend. And it's important to notice that if you're sort of happier with this particular specification, then there is still the effect of time. There is still that trend. So it's clearly, and that is, a, is significant, so it's, it's clear that something is happening to simultaneous applications. Yeah, it may not be as radical as uh, the, the uh, shock uh, at enlargement, but um, it's sort of something did happen. Okay, so this is one set of results, and now the interesting question becomes, uh, okay, we, we've seen there was an effect. Is it economically important? Do we care about this? Is this does it matter? You know, should, we, should we worry about it? Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So before that, I have one last test. I, sorry, I'd forgotten about this. So one thing you can do is you can make this model terribly sort of flexible in the sense that you can allow every quarter to have its own effect. Yeah? So what you're looking for here now, again, is, is basically you would want the, um, the average of this to be below zero, and the, these bars here indicate um, a range of statistical sort of uh, significance. So essentially I'm saying that if this effect here, if this bar crosses zero, then this effect that I'm measuring here is statistically not distinguishable from zero. Yeah? So every time the zero is inside this particular range that's indicated here by the, um, um, by these, uh, by the lines, yeah, um, then the effect that I'm measuring for that particular quarter could also be zero and we couldn't distinguish the two. Uh -huh. So it turns out that before 2001 there are a couple of quarters where we get significant sort of negative effects and after 2001 we get a couple of quarters where there are significant positive effects. So it, again, the, the data suggests there was some increase in simultaneous applications, um, but it's perhaps not quite as pretty as I would like it to be. Yeah. So if, if I could choose, of course, then I would have all the error bars below zero here and all of them way above afterwards, and then I'd be really confident that there was a significant shift. Okay. Here it looks more incremental. Okay. Right. So now let's try and figure out whether we can say a little bit more than just, okay, there was a positive effect and it was significant. So <clears throat> as I told you before, what I'm measuring in the class of pharmaceuticals is actually a mixture of the pharmaceutical applicants who are applying for names that are regulated and other companies that are applying for names for pharmaceutical pro uh, products that are not regulated by name regulation. Yeah? So that's this number here. This is the average. And it's an average of a group of unregulated firms and their simultaneous applications and the regulated firms and their simultaneous applications. So capital N here is the number of regulated firms, capital O is the number of non-regulated firms, and this expression is basically just giving me this average. Yeah? And then what I did was I introduced a factor which says that <coughs> um, the proportion of these two groups within this set of pharmaceutical applicants is constant over time. Yeah? I can rewrite the whole thing like this, and what I'm doing by blue here is I'm marking numbers that I can observe in the data. Yeah? So I know this number for before and after the shock, and I know this number if I'm willing to make the assumption that the firms that are inside my pharmaceutical group but that are not regulated by the name regulator um, are behaving in exactly the same way as all the other firms in the system that are outside pharmaceuticals. Yeah? Then I can also get this number. Okay. And then um, I did a couple of more things. I assumed that name review is equally tough in each of the countries, and then I used this data that you saw earlier by Lallemand to, to calculate how difficult it is actually to convince the regulator in each country. Yeah. Then I assumed that these two probabilities here don't, or, or proportions and probabilities don't change uh, at the shock. Um, and then finally I put that all back into my economic model, um, and so what I can then work out from that is that between 2001 and 2004, every year um, we spent about 17.7 .7 million US dollars on inventing surplus names. Okay, so that's you can do this with this uh, with this economic model. Now there, there's quite a lot we have to dis you know I, I wouldn't put too much sort of uh, emphasis on this number. 
Yeah? There are a lot of very strong assumptions going into this calculation here. Okay? But I did it because um, basically one of my referees was asking me, well, can you tell me a little bit more about what your results imply? You know, is there anything, any number that can come out of these? And, <clears throat> and so I was really tempted to try and figure out something, and, and I, so I pushed the model as far as I could go. Yeah? And I would say that, for example, the model using the estimates that I have is suggesting that this proportion of pharmaceutical, real pharmaceutical applicants in that group of firms applying uh, in that pharmaceutical class is quite high. It's saying it's 96%. And my expectation is that that, that number is too high. I would, I would have expected that proportion to be a bit lower. Um, and so uh, I guess some of the assumptions I'm making here to get to that, to identify that particular uh, variable is, is, are probably too strong. Um, but anyway, so what we have is a number which gives us some indication of, of, of how expensive this, is, this has been. Yeah? And an important assumption going into that number is that each new pharmaceutical trademark costs $25,000, uh, which is at the lower end of that range that I showed you before. Yeah? So the journal suggested that this could go up by a factor of seven. And so then we can scale up this number by a factor of seven as well. Okay. Right, so if we do that, if we say that we're spending about $50 million on invented names that we don't necessarily really need, yeah, so then the interesting question is, can we, can we reduce that cost? Would that be something we could do? And so there are two answers to that. One answer is probably a little bit, yeah, because if we didn't have as much clutter, then maybe we wouldn't have to invent quite so many names simultaneously. But we're never going to get back to a situation where the pharmaceutical applicant applies for only one name because there's always the risk that the name regulator says this particular name doesn't work in my jurisdiction. And I think there's, n I, I can't think of any intervention that we could create to regulate the system that would remove that. You know? the, the pharmaceutical firm is always going to face the risk that it's picked a name that doesn't work. You know? Um, so all that we can do is we can try and make it easier for them to pick the names, but we can't totally remove this, this phenomenon of simultaneous applications, I would think. Uh, okay. Right, so just to contrast the number that I came up with here before, okay, so this is the number that comes out of this diff and diff framework. Um, if you use the other empirical framework that I was talking about earlier on, yeah, so I'll, I'll just jump over to, to the, the results here now. Um, you get significantly, and I'd like you to just focus on this particular column here, uh -huh. um, and all these numbers are derived under slightly different assumptions on how you use this estimator, which are technical and we don't really have to go into because they're all more or less in the same range. Yeah? They're significantly higher than the numbers you saw before. Yeah? The numbers you saw before were 0 0.06, and now we've got numbers in the range between 14 and 18. Yeah? Um, so you can see the effect here is bigger. So what's happening here now is that the estimator is really picking the pharmaceutical firm with a particular set of characteristics and comparing it to another firm with similar characteristics and then trying to see how do they differ in their behavior. Okay? And uh, there is an argument to be made for the fact that this estimator is more appropriate here because the two groups of firms are just so different in their characteristics to start out with, okay? Um, so all that I think we can take away from this exercise is that there's another reason here to believe that the effect is probably larger than the number I gave you earlier on, yeah? Because the estimate is probably, you know, the estimate of the shock is higher. Yeah? Um, so that's, that's what I would uh, take out of that. Okay, and there's some more robustness checks here. Okay, so now that got a little bit technical at the end, but really <coughs> this is a, my attempt to summarize what I've got uh, in the data. Okay? So I would say that that graphical evidence I showed you at the beginning, uh, in the middle, this picture where I was comparing the different groups of firms, um, doesn't really favor the idea that there's a big jump in cluttering. You, know, that you can see a signal, but it's not like it's uh, overwhelming. Um, once you start applying a sort of econometric results, then you do get some indication that there was an effect. Yeah? Um, and also when you control for specific periods, 
Yeah? So when you allow the, the, the estimator to be very flexible about the effects of individual points in time, we get some evidence of a jump. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> if we include this time trend in the difference in difference model, then the uh, treatment effect uh, is no longer significant. Uh, the trend is also not significant. So here the results are a little bit more ambivalent, but I would point out, this is uh, something I didn't put here, that the, the effect for the period 2001 to 2004 was still significant. Yeah? Um, the matching estimator suggests that uh, enlargement did have a big effect and that those effects could be four times bigger than the ones we got from this other uh, method. Yeah? So if you're wondering why the economist is doing this, why is he using one model and then he's using another model, yeah? uh, this is because I tried to be a little bit open about this. We can see that there are various assumptions going into each of the models. Yeah? And we can have long discussions about whether these assumptions are justified or not. So what we try and do is we apply as many models as possible and try and see whether the results are uh, sort of, uh, you know, fit together. And if they do, we have more confidence in them. So that's essentially what, what we try to do here. Yeah? Okay, so, <clears throat> so if the membership in these groups, yeah, so if the fact that you're a pharmaceutical company is exogenous to European uh, expansion of the European Union, so it's not affected by that, yeah? then the results either show that there was a significant increase in simultaneous applications in 2004 or that there is a positive time trend here. Yeah? Uh, both of the results suggest that something is happening. Um, the matching estimator shows that the effects are pretty significant. Yeah? Um, and the rest here is really just ideas of how we could try and extend the, the, this particular empirical exercise to try and have more confidence in the results. Yeah? So one thing we could do is we could pull in an extra jurisdiction. So we could try and compare, let's say, to the United States, because then we would have more comparisons in the data. Yeah? Um, we could try and be more specific about how we control for pharmaceutical firms, which would require much more effort on identifying the individual companies as companies that are regulated or not regulated. Um, <clears throat> we might want to control for the rate of conversion of trademarks in the particular areas. That's something that I haven't done yet. Um, and reassignments of trademarks for different applicants. Yeah? So these are some of the things that might still be done sort of in this work or in, in other work. Okay, and that's, that's it. Thank you very much, Georg, uh, for uh, this interesting um, presentation. I particularly appreciated that you, know, you, I think, gave quite an extensive motivation of why this is relevant, but then went uh, through the details uh, of your approach and your results.